Good morning, everyone, and welcome to part four of Rebecca. So I just have a few notes about the, the novel overall um, before we get right to the novel itself. Um, as usual, I've gotten behind. It's just I can't help myself when it gets to researching things. So just a couple of things about the novel. Um, it says, let's see, almost from its inception in the 18th century England, the Gothic novel has been adored by readers and deplored by critics. Remember our exploration of Wilkie Collins. That was fun, wasn't it? Um, it's central conventions, nature red in tooth and claw, haunted castles atop windswept moors, defenseless young women at the mercy of a strange, obsessed men with terrible secrets. That's what we have. Um, bondage, imprisonment, torment, ambiguity. Oh, can't read that. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to skip the things that are going to give away um, the end of the novel in case you haven't gotten there but readers love it as well as they should for in the best gothic fiction realism and romance join forces to create a territory somewhere between this world and some other in which almost everything is slightly deliciously over the top i think that's funny um let's see it is no exaggeration to say that du maurier was the 20th century's charlotte bronte and Rebecca, the 20th century's Jane Eyre. The co comparison in the literature between Rebecca and Jane Eyre is pervasive. It's everywhere. But people are, the critics are quick to point out that this is not just a copy. The parallels between the two authors and the two books are obvious. Both Bronte's childhood uh, circumstances are straightened, are strained, sorry, uh, um, du Maurier is, is privileged. Both girls lived essentially interior lives in which the imagination, storytelling, and fantasy are central. Both published early, Bronte under the pseudonym Currabelle, and both became wildly successful. Both women eventually married, Du Maurier e eagerly and Bronte reluctantly. Over the years, there have been countless imitations of Jane Eyre. Whether Rebecca is, in fact, one of these is debatable, but there are similarities. Jane Eyre is a governess to a wealthy girl. The unnamed narrator in Rebecca is companion to a wealthy older woman. Woman, Both women, 19 and 21 years old respectively, are mostly in appearance, or so they think, and beleaguered by self-doubt. Over and over and over, we see the I speaker in Rebecca um, speak about herself in a self-deprecating way. Both come into the employ of brooding, mysterious men in their 40s, and both fall in love with them. Both men harbor dreadful secrets. Um, I, that part I'm going to have to skip. It is tempting to pigeonhole Rebecca as Jane Light. I thought that was interesting. But that simply is not true. And I, I, I read you that other article last week, or portions of it, in which the author concluded the same thing. This is not simply Jane Light. It hasn't quite the depth. If at times it lapses into conventions of the Gothic novel or the English mystery novel, Rebecca is nonetheless a work of immense intelligence and wit, elegantly wit written, thematically solid and suspenseful, even a second time around. So those of you who are reading this a second time are probably going to see things in there that you didn't see the first time. Indeed, let's see. Um, this isn't just a novel about a lovesick girl's obsessive jealousy of her husband's dead first wife. It is also a book about the interweaving of past and present. That is an important thematic over... Um, uh, not overview, um, a thematic part of the novel. Um, du Maurier treats memory with what can only be called delicacy and tenderness. Memory, that's a, an important um, factor. As the novel begins, the narrator is in Monte Carlo, tending to the endless whims of her fatuous employer, Mrs. Van Hopper, and falling in love with Maxime de Winter. 
Looking back, she urgently tries to bring the happy past back to life. Uh, I wanted to go back again to recapture the moment that had gone, and then it came to me as if we did that it would not be the same. Remember, as they are, uh, she she makes this reference several times that she wants to capture a memory and keep it the same. One time she talks about capturing it in a bottle. Another time she talks about um, riding along the road on the way to Manderley and they see a peasant girl and she wants to capture that mo moment, but also adds that if she were to capture it or if they were to go back, the peasant girl may not wave in the same way. So it, it she really, De Maurier investigates the interplay of reality and memory throughout. Um, let's see. Let's see. I'm trying not to read anything that's going to give away the ending. Uh, expressions of this longing uh, of longing arise over and over in Rebecca, lending considerable thematic resonance to the narrator's, narrator's desperate attempt to learn her husband's true feelings about his dead first wife and about herself. The pa passages that we're going to look at today sets the stage for Rebecca's, I mean, um, for the eye speaker's uh, maybe fascination with or obsession with Rebecca. Uh, and everybody seems to be fascinated with the Rebe dead Rebecca. One notable difference between de Maurier's narrator and Jane Eyre is that the latter, though unprepossessing in appearance and manner, is spunky to the core. That's Jane Eyre. The narrator of Rebecca, by contrast, recalls that self who drove to Mandalay for the first time, eager and uh, hopeful and eager, handicapped by a rather desperate gaucherie and filled with an intense desire to please. She laments that poise and grace and assurance are not qualities inbred in me. She often makes a reference to her awkwardness. Remember, I, can't, I don't know if we got to this yet or not, um, where she knocks over a vase of flowers. Um, in Monte Carlo, the first time she's been asked uh, by uh, the first time she even talks to um, Maxime. She envies someone who was never anxious, never tortured by doubt and indecision, someone who never stood as I did, hopeful, eager, frightened, tearing at bitten nails, uncertain which way to go, what star to follow. That is, in fact, our eye speaker. Um, this concludes with the statement, Rebecca is strictly a work of the imagination, one that, if it does not rank quite so high as Jane Eyre, has pleased and mesmerized readers for more than six decades. This was um, published in 2004 by somebody named Jonathan Yardley. And I think that Rebecca has gotten even more attention as the novel ages than it did at the beginning. I mean, it is immensely fun to read. Um, so let's return to the novel. I have some more stuff to tell you. Of course I do have 14 pages of, of interesting things. Um, and I want to go to, oops, that's not right. Um, forgot where we started. Oh yeah, chapter five. This is page 35. So here we have this contrast between now and then in the opening paragraph. I'm glad it cannot happen twice, the fever of first love. Retrospectively, she's saying it's now versus back then. She says, for it is a fever and a burden too, whatever the poets may say. They are not brave the days when we are 21. So here for the first time, we learn how old she is. She's 21. That's really young, especially when you think about um, 
her marrying S Maxine de Winter. She hasn't yet, but she's going to. Um, who's in his 40s. You know, everybody eyebrows up with that one. Um, but we also know from having read this in other pieces of fiction and in other literature that at the time it was still important for women to marry. The, there's a bit of discussion too about, um, oh, I, I misplaced my phone, which I need, I use my phone to keep the book open, but the setting in this novel isn't really clearly defined. And so we are pretty much left to conclude that this is set in the time that it was published, which was 1938. There we are. So keep that in mind. Uh, the I speaker talks about cars. We are used to looking at fiction in the 18, late 1800s where people didn't ride around in cars. And yet now we are suddenly thrust forward into approximately 1938. Um, and I will get to this bit in a minute, but um, even their clothing.